Welcome back to our series, Questions from the Old Testament. In our question for today, number six, we find it from the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, Ruth chapter 1, verse 21. And the question is, why call me Naomi? To give this question context, we'll read chapter 1 of the book of Ruth, beginning in verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephaphathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Our question asked today, why call me Naomi? You may recognize this song. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. That was a popular little ditty of a song on a TV program many years ago. In the short segment, each person would take turns lamenting at the bad turn of events that had come upon them in a rather comical way. The audience would get a good laugh over their rendition. For the vast majority of people, you won't find much, if any, humor found in the calamities of life, and for good reason. Perhaps we have all had something bad happen to us, a fender bender, a job loss, or an illness, or other relatively minor happenings. 
And I say relatively minor because when compared to others who just never seem to catch a break, ours do seem rather less severe. I walked through a cemetery recently near my home and noticed five grave markers of siblings who died all under the age of 19. I cannot imagine the pain of their parents. I'm sure you know of people in your circle that have experienced losses beyond what we can imagine. Naomi, in our passage today, has experienced just such a life. A famine forces them to leave their home and settle in a foreign land. One by one, a husband and both sons die. What do you tell people when you return home? The name Naomi in Hebrew means pleasant, a delight, or splendor. Naomi, or as she desires to be known, Mara, which in Hebrew means bitter, has connected the dots in her own mind and laid this at the feet of the Almighty, Shaddai. It is his doing that she has lost everything and believes it is for her sins that such has happened. Well, she's half right. It was the Almighty's doing, but not for her sins, but really the sins of the whole world. But how could she have known that having only seen the devastation that surrounds her at the time? Naomi couldn't see it then, but she will again be happy. Joseph couldn't see it in Egypt, but he would be happy again. The disciples couldn't see it that sad day on the Passover when their Savior died. But they would again be happy. The church in Revelation might not have seen it in their tribulation, but they would be happy one day. You and I might not see it in our lives, the struggles and trials that we endure. But James tells us in his letter some very promising results of our trials. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And I wonder if I can see the blessings and the bitterness of today's trials. Our question number seven comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? To give this question context, we'll be reading verses 1 through 27 of 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Socha, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Socha and Azekah in Ephes the Mim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. 
Now David was the son of an Ephaphrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took a stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning, and left his sheep with a keeper, and took the provisions, and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines, and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For... Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Have you ever been part of a conversation when someone remarks about a somewhat famous person? I remember when he or she was just a child. I knew then that they would grow up to be someone special. Or maybe the flip side of that might be, I never would have guessed they would have amounted to anything. It is interesting, but of no surprise, that the only one who saw the greatness of David was God. Not Samuel, not his father, not his brothers, and certainly not King Saul, as we shall see. We read in the previous chapter those powerful words of God to Samuel. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. The Lord looks on, pardon me, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Even today, those words startle and challenge us to remember it is not the outward appearance that makes the person, but what is on the inside. In my mind, I can just imagine the conversation around the dinner table of Jesse and his sons when David is asked about how his day went, perhaps rather nonchalantly telling them, Oh, I killed a lion with my bare hands today when he tried to take one of the lambs. As courageous as it might seem to kill a lion or a bear when you are alone, it is quite another to go up against the champion of the Philistines, who in all likelihood is at least twice your size. But notice what David tells Saul in 1 Samuel 17, verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. David's faith was not in his own strength, but in the Lord, for he gives the glory to God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He's just another foe that the Lord shall deliver into David's hand. A good companion reading for today would be David's 18th Psalm. God would continue to lay waste to all of David's enemies. I wonder what prevents us from having this confidence in our Lord.
Our eighth question today comes from the book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. Who is able to govern this, your great people? In order to give this question context, we'll be reading verses 1 through 15 of 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offerings at high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude." Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. Did you hear about the man who was forced to return his humility award he was given last year? Apparently you're not allowed to display it. <laughs> yes, that's an oldie but a goodie. But it does serve to show that wanting to tell others about how humble we are proves we are not actually that humble. Hey, those are the rules. I don't make them. In another instance, during a major award show, one of the presenters joked that there were actually two envelopes. And if anyone really didn't believe they deserved the award, they would give it to the second place candidate in that category. Well, guess what? Nobody turned down their award that night. Solomon truly felt he was at a deficit in regards to his ability to lead God's people. Unlike an election in which the most popular wins in his campaign on behalf of their worthiness, the leader of Israel at this time was born into that position. When David came near to death, there was a struggle for the throne when Adonijah declared that he was king. Oddly enough, it is not Solomon who contends for the throne against him, but Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. It is worth noting that Absalom, Solomon's brother, had previously desired a throne and met a tragic end in that pursuit. But we don't read of Solomon longing for the throne. Now, it is written that David ruled seven and a half years in Hebron, and therein are listed the sons born to him there, in 2 Samuel chapter 3 and 1 Chronicles chapter 3. Then David rules 30 years in Jerusalem, and his sons born to him there are listed in 1 Chronicles chapter 3. I include this to show that Solomon was likely in his late 20s or early 30s when he began to reign, just like his father in 2 Samuel chapter 5. 
Solomon is of age and mature, having grown up in the king's palace his entire life. It is also worth noting that nowhere else in the Old Testament, yes, the whole Bible, do we read of God approaching someone in a dream to ask what they want. Typically, it's the other way around that people come to God with their wants, and usually in trying times. God shows us by what the inspired writer has given us what is truly the state of Solomon's heart. Now, do you remember what God was willing to give David? We read in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 8, And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. It is quite likely that God would have done the same for Solomon. But in a stunning turn of events, this is all that Solomon wants. Read in verse 9. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? Solomon understood that he was already king, yet what he truly desired was to rule God's people the way that God desired. It is no wonder that Solomon could write the book of Proverbs so that all who wanted wisdom might partake. Contained within the book of Proverbs is the golden key that unlocks the purest and most precious of true wisdom. And Solomon gladly tells us what it is that we may have it as well. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He repeats it again in chapter 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Imagine that you are in the place of Solomon, and God offers to give you whatever you want. What would you ask of God? Our question number nine comes from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, chapter 1. Are there not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel? To give this question context, we'll be reading the first chapter of 2 Kings. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice in the upper chamber of Samaria and lay sick. So he sent messengers telling them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from the sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, You shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah went. The messengers returned to the king, and he said to them, Why have you returned? And they said to him, There came a man to meet us, and said to us, Go back to the king who sent you, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but shall surely die. He said to them, What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist, and he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent to him a captain of fifty men with his fifty. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, Come down. But Elijah answered the captain of fifty, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again the king sent to him another captain of fifty men with his fifty. And he answered and said to him, O man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. But Elijah answered them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again the king sent the captain of a third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of the fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and entreated him. O man of God, 
Please let my life and the life of these fifty servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of fifty men with their fifties. But now let my life be precious in your sight. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of this word? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because Ahaziah had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Our question for the day comes from 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 18, but it is a question posed many times in the historical books of 1 and 2 Kings. Warning, history lesson straight ahead. I'm obligated to rather tongue-in-cheek make this statement, seeing how so many people take so little interest in history until they need it, and then sadly it is beyond their grasp. George Santayana has famously said, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Yet a grasp of history is not something you consume in an afternoon or an evening's leisurely reading. History is slowly digested over a long period of time, and one contemplates and connects the actions with consequences and not merely events and happenings. Having read over the years what authors have written on the subject of the compilation of the history of Israel and Judah, I am more and more amazed with the passing of time, the scale and the size of such a work. What is equally amazing is the thought of what to leave out. To even the most casual of readers, it is apparent the differences of the accounts recorded in the books of Samuel, the books of Kings, and the book of Chronicles. All that we have to identify who the author and authors were of these books. Some traditions say Samuel wrote 1 Samuel, but it is apparent he could only have written up to the point of his own death. But who wrote after this is only speculation. As to the book of Kings, it may be that there were several authors who compiled this at time as time progressed. But many noted scholars say it was Jeremiah the prophet. It is probable that this is a compilation of sorts from previous individual writings. As to the book of Chronicles, the strongest case can be made for Ezra. Scholars claim they believe this because of the tendencies toward the priestly order and because of the ending which takes place after the return from captivity. Now, that is the scantest of thumbnail sketches of these books. Many of the occurrences are recorded in at least two of the three accounts. They appear to be out of order, yet they appear to have varying views of the accounts. Yet, when overlaid over each other, just like transparencies we used in days gone by and overhead projectors, they give us a depth of the history when viewed together. It is amazing how this history has been challenged by secular historians over the years and centuries, yet have been nonetheless proved to be reliable in its historical backdrop. Each of these books has its own unique style. Are those accounts written elsewhere? Yes, they are. And they are there to give us even more of the old, old story as seen from the eyes and ears of those who saw and listened and read for themselves. How do we encourage believers to learn from the things written in times gone by? Our tenth question comes from the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3. Nehemiah asks the question, Why should not my face be sad? To give this question context, we'll begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 1 down through verse 5 of chapter 2. 
The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Chapter 2 In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad, when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, when I had given him a time. Before we consider the question of the day, I'd like to read some quotes for you. 80% of life is showing up. Half the battle is showing up. The world is run by those who show up. Decisions are made by those who show up. By now, you have perceived the pattern in these quotes. Those quotes have been used by many a motivational speaker over the years to try to instill in people the idea of the need and necessity of just showing up. Don't say, oh, that's, that's somebody else's problem, or what can I do? I don't have those skills, or what can one person do? Over and over in the Bible, we find that God qualified the called and not the other way around. Remember the quote, experts built the Titanic, but an amateur built the ark. Space doesn't allow me to spell out the incidences of those amateurs that God used to achieve what he wanted done. Well, that doesn't usually stop me. Consider the young shepherd boy, David, or the exiled prisoners, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah, who stood up to the most powerful leader in the world. Or how about that young exile girl, Esther, who saved a nation by her courage? Or the young girl who was called on to bring a Savior into the world and raise him? You get the idea. We come to the book of Nehemiah now. What do you say we just skip over much of the details and go right to the end where the wall is built and everybody lives happily ever after? 
Well, where's the lesson in that? But all that happens in Judea brings back in Susa, or Shushan, depending on your translation, the winter residence of the kings of Persia. We begin to hear of a minor character, but for the task to come would be unknown to history. After all, how many cupbearers to the king darken the pages of history? With the exception of the cupbearer in the days of Joseph, I'm challenged to name another. Then we find the heart of this cupbearer is touched by the report of the condition of a place he has neither lived in nor ever seen, for that matter. But his heart is touched. In the many times I've read this passage, I've never come away with the impression that Nehemiah said, oh, that's somebody else's problem, or what can I do? I don't have those skills. Or what can one person do? What he proceeds to do is pray. Now, unless you grasp the numbering system of months in the time, you don't grasp how long this takes. But the month of Chislev corresponds to the ninth month. Fast forward to chapter 2 and verse 1, and we find Nehemiah before the king in the month of Nisan. This is the first month of the year. At the very least, it has been three and maybe four months that Nehemiah has been praying and is still in sadness over what he has heard about Jerusalem. His sad face is noticed by the king, and as the conversation progresses, Nehemiah asks the king of Persia, in effect, if a cupbearer can go take on the monumental task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Talk about showing up. As we say, see the need, fill that need. Nehemiah was stirred to his very soul and didn't let his perceived lack of expertise in building stop him from taking on one of the most unbelievable tasks we have seen by a so-called amateur. But remember, who built the Titanic? I wonder what would happen if more of us just showed up. And Lord willing, Let's meet again tomorrow and look at another question from the Old Testament.